Thomas Jefferson, far as a figure to me, simply is that he was the third president of the United States. Recently, um, I've become very interested in him because he was the owner of three sets of my ancestors that make me who I am. So naturally, I'm digging for all the information that I can um, to understand the man in order to understand from where I came as far as the treatment of my ancestors and the roles that they would have played in America. To me, it's very, very rewarding to go to the library and to be able to pick up a book on Jefferson and find the names of my ancestors, such as my uh, fourth great grandfather or further back, um, to date from our first American ancestor through to my grandchild is 10 generations. And to me, that's very rewarding and fulfilling. Third president, Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States, uh, beginning and ending. Um, I didn't know much about him, wasn't interested in him as I'm not, or wasn't very interested in, in a lot of the quote unquote founding fathers of America, simply because I never related to them. Um, that's basically about it. It was just like a, a surface history that I really comprehended. My fourth grade Virginia history book, far as uh, blacks or African Americans or slaves, I remember two incidents is where they uh, talk about the slaves. One was uh, during the war between the states, they talk about some slaves uh, ran off because they heard of rumors that they were going to be emancipated, where others were loyal to the, to the ones that they loved, meaning their owners, because they were well treated and cared for. Um, another instance was when they were talking about the roles that the slaves or servants played, which was uh, some were field hands where others learned to become blacksmiths and they worked in the kitchen and they were cared for well, they were well fed, clothed, and when they were sick they were given medicine. Um, during the time that um, we read the account of the war between the states, I was really, really emotional at at least a surrender because, number one, I was a Virginian, you know, and Lee did this out of the goodness of his heart to protect his men, to give them warm clothes and, and shelter, you know, because they had been out in the um, war for so long trying to fight to hold up, uphold what they believed in and what they needed. And to me, it's just so misleading because it does not go into the roles that we actually played or actually the whole uh, war itself, you know. Yes, it was the needs of the southern planners versus the needs of the um, northerners, but far as the factual things that actually went on, you don't get any of that. You don't understand it, you don't comprehend it, so you're looking at one thing one way. Basically, Jefferson in his role to me, Jefferson symbolizes America in the sense that Jefferson was a man of his time. And he was no different from any other man with the exception of, of his political and uh, financial status. Jefferson <laughs> was vital in the writing of the Declaration of the Independence. He was the third president, but he was a man and he owned slaves and he profited from his slaves. He was a very curious man in the sense that um, he always wanted to analyze things. And he analyzed the best way to uh, make a profit, um, whether a slave was better suited. Uh, he tried to utilize each person um, in the sense of where they could, um, where he could make the most from them. Some were more capable or trustworthy, so he would have them closer to him, where others were better field hands or whatever, some young boys. He utilized the sick, the boys, the girls, the old women, each one of them. He never had a, a slave that was not worked. You know, he basically studied the whole thing. I can't say that I agree with all of his facts or findings, but at the same time, he. Um, if you were sick, then you had an easier day. Maybe you just shelled corn that day. Whereas um, when they got old, well, you can nurse 
stay in the house and take care of the children. You know, everybody had a job, so he didn't have anybody. It was no dead meat, you know. Max Jefferson, a man of his time, he was no different from anyone else. He was a human, he was not a god. Uh, Jefferson, I can't say whether he was bad or good. I think many of his slaves were uh, treated better, uh, particularly my family line, because my family line were closely related to his wife. And uh, there was a kinship there. And I firmly believe that kinship from, from his line as well. And um, from that point, the house servants there were, were treated better. As far as him being bad, I think he was a, a man, a lustful man. And I think he utilized what, it was, what he had to utilize. I met um, a historian in the District of Columbia, I believe in 95, that's on the uh, board at Monticello. And uh, they, I was introduced to her, her as, as she was the director of whatever. And you know, they said Monticello. It meant absolutely nothing to me until they said Charlottesville, because my concept, Monticello and Charlottesville, it didn't, you know, the two did not mesh for me. But once she said Charlottesville, a bell lit up. I said, oh, that's where I need to go. That's where my great granddaddy's from. That's where Wormley's from. And uh, we shared a little bit of information. I networked with her as well as she with me. And uh, we exchanged phone numbers and addresses. And I gave her my uh, great grandfather's name, which was Wormley Hughes. And um, from that point, a couple of months later, I got a letter from her. And she said that uh, she found in the census records of 1850 that there was a Wormley Hughes, who was the gardener at Jefferson's estate, um, in the household of his half-brother, Burrell Colbert. And uh, could this be a connection? So I figured a Wormley Hughes, Charlottesville, yes, it's a connection, but this was like 100 years off from, from my great-grandfather. I said maybe his grandfather or something of that nature. But I had nothing to go on. I could not make a connection. Plus, I was working on another project, and I really didn't have the time to pursue it because I needed to leave out of the county. Finally, th this was around May. I received the letter from her in August. Around January, I got curious again. Time was, we were snowbound a couple of days, so I had time to do a little research. So um, following up on that, I wrote to her, or called her one, I believe I called her, and she sent me some information on Wormley, who was the gardener, and tells me that um, he buried Jefferson. Now this Wormley was like my third grandfather. I think that's the way it is, my third great-grandfather. Um, and he went by the name of Hughes. I started with this history of wanting to know. I've always wanted to know since I was a child. I'm always curious, but I could never hold the names in my head. I had to write everything down. And um, around uh, 1990, being a mother of teenagers, um, I just felt that my kids were kids, not only when I say my kids, I'm talking about kids within the community as well as my, my own daughter. Um, tend to take uh, education and the school system a little bit for granted. Um, it really bothered me in the sense that I thought that they had a great opportunity and they should utilize what they had. And I felt that that it wasn't a connection there with who they were or who they, where they came from. And I thought maybe if we started documenting some information, then maybe they would, wouldn't take things so, so lightly. Because I remember, um, in 1968, when I first went to the high school in my area, it was forced integration at that point. And up to that point, I never really had any idea of the differences of races uh, other than speaking to people on the street and going my own way. As a mother in the 90s of a teenage daughter and other children, I felt it necessary to reach out and to try to uncover my roots. Um, in the sense of learning more about my ancestors and the roles that they played in America. Having lived through the integration of 1968 and to know what I went through as a child and trying to relate and trying to understand, I felt that, I felt the need to utilize things that were available to us. And I felt that if 
my children and the children in the community in which I live understood the roles that each of our ancestors played, I felt that they would feel better about themselves and better understand the need to proceed on in life. I started uh, researching my line uh, by questioning aunts and uh, parents, and I'd just write down everything that I could. Um, I started with a basic oral history, and then one day I was at a bookstore and I found a book on the births within the county. So I went through there and I found a couple of my ancestors and then I found another book written by the same person. And then from that point, the book told where you could go for more information. So I visited the local record area where you could receive your marriage, birth, deaths, wills, those type of things. So I utilized all the local sources. And as I would do that, when we'd have family gatherings, I would share with my family. and. Each time, one ancestor would automatically, it would bring a tale back uh, a little bit about something that I'd found. It would uh, spark a memory. And again, I would write that down. And um, I started a notebook for each line of my family. Oh, one of them was basically setting up the family lines as to what time frame they were all. One thing that fascinated me was during the Civil War, my mother told the tale of one of my family line when the uh, Northern armies were locally in the county, um, they sh around their owner, they would say, I wish these men would go home type thing. And then as soon as the owner's back would turn, they were giving them all the food that they could give them, you know, and give them supplies. I and mean, yes, yeah, sir, just help yourself, just give, give them everything. Another story that um, one of my cousins told, he's um, 86 years old now, he remembered one of my ancestors um, in the Gainesville area of Virginia telling a tale about the old Carolina Road and said that the Carolina Road not only served as a means of the Underground Railroad, but the slave traders uh, exported and imported slaves back and forth to the south on this line and said that they each time they always had to make an example that uh, whenever one of the children would be crying a lot, whether it would be from tiredness of hunger or cold or whatever, that they would literally bash the kid's head against a tree in order to make an example to the mothers to keep the children quiet. So from that point on, the children were quiet. Beyond angry and hurt and outraged, you know, um, I don't dwell a lot on, on any of that. I just take it for what it's worth, and the worth is to let me know the capabilities of man and to know that this these were, were, were people, and they were human. Um, I can't begin to understand the rationale behind all of this other than to make them feel in charge or in control or whatever. I can't go there often. It's too painful. The first time I went to Monticello, it was unnerving to the sense that when we pulled up into the lot and we saw the stables and we were told that my great, great, great grandfather would have worked in that stables and we saw the grounds and he was a gardener there. And to know the love of flowers and plants and gardening of my father and aunt, you know, it just made me connect, you know, and I felt like I was walking in their actual footprints. and. Um, it made me feel very, very fulfilled and connected. It made me feel a sense of belonging. And then from that point, um, as we walked through the house and uh, under the arch going into the library, that was very dramatic because one of the great uncles did the carving and the connecting of, of that. And to see the books and so many things and characteristics that that house shows and, and holds, it tr holds true today for my family, as far as the colors of rooms, uh, the love of books, the <laughs> the air, the views and things, those are things that, that we as a family connect to. Um, to work on those grounds, I, th I think you had to really, really analyze your slaveholder as you would on any plantation, but those grounds in particular I think you had, would have to know the mood that he was in on a particular day. 
in order to have how to function that day. And I think you would have to take it one day at a time. Um, walking those grounds is <laughs> is tremendous, and um, where the a Mulberry Row is, uh, where the slave quarters and the artisans uh, shops were. Most of, of my f immediate family were on Mulberry Road or in close uh, slave quarters there. And um, they were basically the artisans and, and the house servants there. So I tend to believe that they had a easier time than a lot of the slaves. Not to say that they had a, a, a joyous <laughs> life by any means. I think it would have been hard because even even the elite slaves, and they were, but they were always, they were also separated as a family. They Their family units were not always together. And I think you had to take it one day at a time. <laughs> to be a slave, you were not in control of any of your needs, wants, desires, or anything you were controlled by someone else. Your thoughts you were dictated to. Um, you may have had inward opinions and thoughts, but you could never display them. Um, as a slave, you would have to teach your children different than what you would teach them now. A mother now would, in being a black Baptist, you you know, you, you turn that other cheek and you know, you. You do the things differently. Back then, I would imagine a mother would say, yes, I born your child, but no. You never look a man in the face. Never look a man in the eye. You gotta be tough. You gotta work. You gotta do this. You've gotta do that. And I can imagine her telling her daughters, look pretty for the master, child, because this might get you an easier day. I, I mean, when I walk on some of those plantations, or even Jefferson's plantation, and I'm short-winded after going up one hill, and I think about the grounds that were kept, the gardens that were kept, I do whatever I had to do to survive, and I don't think they would have been any different. You had to harden your heart. Um, during that time frame, families for blacks were not um, families. You would give birth to a child, and you'd try to raise the child to be um, independent of, of a family. Yes, you would want to reach out and nurture your child, but if you nurtured the child, you were not teaching them how to survive. You had to be hard with your children. Um, not to say that a that mother wouldn't love that child, wouldn't cuddle that child, but at the same time, the more you would do that, the harder it would be for that child. Today, women, especially myself, if I have a child in my arm, I'm going to rock that child. Back then, if you rocked that child, you're nurturing that child to bond with you. You could not raise your children realistically to bond with you because the separation would almost kill them, and you as well. I believe that slave women, house servants, basically bonded with those little white children, their master's children, because it was a bond there as long as they were in that, that area. And most of those children, their nurses, uh, slave nurses or mammies or whatever you want to call them, those children, you know, really looked up to them and, and it was a closer bond with them because many of them were their wet nurses. The whole family scene for our separation, whether you were going down south or to the plantation next day, all of it was traumatic because each day of your life you had to sit back and watch either your ch child being defiled or sold off or hired out to someone else where you had no control over it. A man had to watch his wife carry someone else's child and have no control over it. Or to, a woman to stand there and watch her husband being beat or the vice versa. You, you had no control over these things. These were things that you had to learn to tolerate, to, um, tolerate in the sense of except for what it was. You had no control over it. I would imagine if you went to a slave auction and you were sold and you were going down south, that means hard work, it means disease, malaria, and a detachment of, of anything familiar. Because first of all, the person that you would be sold to, you wouldn't know. Um, nine times out of 10, you wouldn't be in the company of any slaves that you knew. And you may not even um, totally understand anything about what was going on, because many, many youth were sold at that time. 
uh, 12, 13, 14-year-olds were sold, and they were shipped down along with the runaways or people with many scars because um, they would send them down south. That was a way of punishment. Any rebellious people, we'll, we'll work it out of them. We will control them one way or the other t type attitude. Scars from um, beatings. The bulk of the joys would be after hours, after dark. I would feel for, for many blacks, that was their time when their masters were sleeping, whether it would be for, for playing music or, or clapping or telling tales or quilting or, or cooking and feeding each other. It was their time. And many of them stayed up late just to have their time. And many people, I don't believe, un totally understood they may have worked in the fields anywhere from 10, 12, 14 hours a day, but those three or four hours that they had together as a family or as a unit, that's what got them through the next 14 hours. You had to have some type of mental stability in order to endure and to get through. And it was like, a, to me, one day at a time in order to manage whatever the next day may bring because you may have gone to sleep that night feeling comfort to know that I had six children and I have three of them with me today where tomorrow you may have none or you may be gone and your children may still be there. You had no control, no say, no anything. It was never a leverage. To me, slaves, free blacks, indentured servants all hope for the same thing, some type of freedom in a system of which equality would someday exist. Um, freedom in the sense of the right to go to the church or to sit where you'd want to sit, or the freedom to, to have a garden and feed your children, or freedom to have a, a home or a blanket to put them under. I believe Jefferson's early thoughts on, on slavery was probably to abolish it. Later on, he became a man, very, a, a very strong Virginian, <laughs> put it like that. He, uh, he lived by his slaves. He, uh, I think he was also a person that had to have complete control or the sense of, of, of control over everything and everyone as uh, far as labor, the production of labor, um, where one would go and come. But at the same time, many of my ancestors were able to move around f freer uh, even though they were slaves. When Jefferson spoke of freedom and equality. He was speaking of freedom and equality for people that were white. He was not speaking of slaves or the black man simply because they were considered as property, not as individuals. Um, his analysis of people of color um, in his mind was always inferior, um, except with the exception of music, musical uh, ability as far as tone and but I can't really dwell a lot on that um, far as his his thoughts because I tend not to get too deeply involved with his thoughts on freedom or anything because to a certain extent it um, brings up certain hostilities within me simply because I know that the man was living in his times and I, I realized that um, during that time frame in order to maintain these large plantations or these homes, a certain amount of labor was needed. But I also know that this labor was my black ancestors, you know. And it was not only Jefferson, but it was people, period. It was their needs. And we were utilized to fulfill their needs and wants and lust. This is the way America was, was, <laughs> was they came here. White people or English people or whatever came here into America seeking f certain freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion or whatever. But these certain freedoms were maintained and received by the sweat of the black man. And America was built by the trade, the work, the jobs that the blacks endured during this time frame. 
a strong symbol of it uh, because he was one of the quote unquote founding fathers and he was a slave owner. It's as simple as that. I can't dwell a lot on Jefferson or Monticello or his role as the third president or anything else. Um, Jefferson is of little importance to me, to be very, very honest with you. Um, I know that he is one of my ancestors, one way or the other, whether it's a great uncle or grandfather line or whatever, it's whatever you choose to believe. Um, but there are too many similarities for me not to, for me to deny it. Mm -hmm. But my concern with Jefferson is merely trying to understand what my black ancestors dealt with during that time frame. When I walk there, I, I tr try to put myself in, in the shoes of that woman or man working there for that day. Um, how easy was it to maintain food from that kitchen? And could you keep it warm enough to get upstairs? And how many times was it sent back for you to rewarm it? Or if the sauce wasn't just right, would you have to go back down there and stand in that, you know, area, the fireplace area where you were cooking from. And those are the type of things. So how many times from that little dumb waiter was things sent back and forth? What was being sent back and forth? And I do believe that there were little messages from my ancestors sent back and forth to ways of communicating different things. And I'm sure they had secret codes for everything. It's no different today when you're working or you, you do what you have to do to survive. I believe when Jefferson died, a lot of the feelings of my ancestors died with him, simply because during the time that he was living, they had more freedoms than what many slaves had. And upon his death, they were sold to um, pay off many of his debts. Um, some were spread out through the um, through the area here in uh, Charlottesville and in Virginia, and some were not so fortunate as to stay in this area. But there was a great separation of, of family. Um, my ancestors were were sold, uh, some to the university. Um, one of the uh, men of the university had one line, which was um, Ursula, who was a pastry cook. She was my um, great great great-grandmother. She was one of my grandmothers. And uh, her children, one of them being Robert, which was my great-great-grandfather. And um, I knew nothing of him. But at two years old, being sold, that, that is just overwhelming to me. You know, it's, it's hard to conceive everything that they had to go through to, to survive. As long as Jefferson lived, it was a sense of, of, of unity, a sense of belonging, because Jefferson was a man of his time, but for the most part, many of my ancestors were treated reasonably well and they moved without uh, a lot of limitations. Some of them, quote unquote, uh, ran away. Upon Jefferson's death, my ancestors were separated even more as a family. Um, Wormley's wife, and who was my great-great-great-grandfather, um, she and several of her younger children were sold to the University of Virginia. Many of them uh, were dispersed throughout Virginia, uh, one and two members at a time. Some were sold as groups, as, as families, but not all of them. Even during Jefferson's early life, groups, family groups were, were separated. But upon his death, you had no hopes of being maintain as a family. At least when he was living, uh, the Hemings, Hughes, Great George's line, which are all my ancestors, they were basically together. Now there were one or two that, that were separated or put on other plantations. See, that's the other thing. When 
when these people had plantations, some of them had three or four. So you may have a husband living on one plantation and a wife on another and children on another. It just depends on what that owner needed at the time. And slavery, you can almost say it depends on the needs of the owner. It was on an individual basis as to the care and the treatment of, of the slaves as to what the owner needed or what his desires were. But upon Jefferson's death, it was no hope for family unity because he was gone. The head, head of Monticello was gone. And, well, I think it was sad. I, I really do. And I think uh, the bulk of them, as far as my family line, I think they cared about Jefferson. Um, not only from the sense of, um, not only Jefferson, but Jefferson's children as well, because there was a kinship there. And it's what they knew. It was familiar to them. That was home. Wormley, my third, third great-grandfather, I believe, was the gardener there. Uh, he also worked in the nailery, and he worked with the horses in the stables and things. Um, but when Jefferson died, he dug the grave for Jefferson. And he often walked the gardens with Jefferson. There are accounts of, of him, you know, covering this or covering that for the frost. and. Uh, Jefferson wrote everything down. There's a farm account book that has so many accounts of the different lines of my family where they were given woolen blankets or rations of food or just numbers of things, yardage of, of cloth for, for their clothes and everything, which means a lot to me. I'm glad he was, in a sense, an advocate, <laughs> documentator, but simply because I can find out more about, about my ancestors and, and the treatment that they were given. It's just that I don't have the time to really get into it the way I would like to. Upon Jefferson's death, there is a recorded inventory and appraisal of his estate, which includes his slaves because they were property. There was a Negro man by the name of Barnaby who was valued at $480, a Negro woman by the name of Betty Brown who was worth nothing, a Negro woman, Critter, who was also worth nothing, a Negro man, Wormley, who was valued at $200, a Negro woman, Ursula, and a young child at $300. These were just a few in out of a two-page list. That Negro woman, Ursula, was sold to a man here at the university. Uh, Ursula, Critter, George, Robert, and Burwell were sold for $1,100. These are my direct family lines. Ursula served as a pastry cook. Um, Robert, who was two years old at the time of this sale, uh, went on to be a preacher here in Charlottesville. But for the most part, not all of these slaves that were separated from family or from Monticello or from familiar grounds were fortunate enough to be sold as, as family units. Um, the younger children of Ursula and, and Wormley were kept together as a unit. Jefferson's daughter, um, from what I'm told, um, informally freed uh, Wormley, who, the gardener, and some of the other family members as well. But for the most part, they were sold, and any hopes of being kept together as a family was gone. Everything was just what you once knew as familiar was not there anymore. So you had to start over in a quest of how to survive today. Reading the list and you look at the value of everyone, this part was not too overwhelming for me because I've been working realizing that this was a normal for, for that type time frame since 1990 um, because I've been researching my other family lines. I think initially when I read the very first one was far more dramatic than reading this one with an account of, of my own family um, because you realize it becomes very real that these people were not considered people, they were considered property. And property owners could do whatever they so desired to do with them. Um, if they chose not to beat you, um, they would receive more money 
from a, a, a slave with no scars than they would for a slave with scars. When I look at the um, free register of blacks, um, in 1793 it became a Virginia law that if you were free you had to carry a certificate stating that you were free and who freed you and a description. And they would talk about the scars and how many fingers you had, whether you were nearly white or whether you were black or... These descriptions to me was like the idea of branding cattle because I grew up on westerns and cowboys and Indians, that type thing. And when I really started reading this, then at the same time I was, was thankful that they did the descriptions because I could visualize what my ancestors would have appeared to be. So it's a, a mixed bag, but at the same time it's very, very hard. It's a bitter pill to try to swallow. And you can't, for me, I can't dwell a lot on the bad parts of slavery, which I can't say that there's any good part of it, but I can't dwell a lot on the treatment of the slaves because it will definitely harden your heart if you, you know, just constantly go over, go over, go over that. I just have to take it as it was history. It's, it's, that's from where we came. To me, there's a great lesson to learn. Um, America was built, it was formed and the idea that all men are created equal, and this is the goal that we must achieve, that we are created equal. And until one day that we wake up and we don't see the differences that each one of us have, you know, there's always going to be some type of prejudice, or some type of um, of people feeling superior or inf inferior, and. I think that's something that it will be. I don't think that's going to change, but I think for the most part of slavery, the best thing that we can learn from that is to learn <laughs> that it's not right. It's not, it's no justice in it. For the reality of the roles that slaves and where they were, to me, one of the things that stands out a lot is upon Jefferson's death. There, were, there was a recorded appraisal and inventory of his estate. And on the inventory, they list the slaves because they were property. There was a Negro man, Barnaby, who was valued at $400. Negro woman, Betty Brown, who was worth nothing. Critter, Negro woman, worth nothing. Negro woman, Ellen, $300. Negro man, Peter Hemings, $400. Negro, Sally Hemings, $200. Negro man, Wormley, $200. Negro woman, Ursula and her young child, $300. Negro woman, Anne and her young child, $350. And it goes on down. It, it lists all of his slaves. This Negro woman, Ursula and her young child, and a few of her other younger children were sold to the university for $1,100. On this account, it lists Ursula, Critter, George, Robert, and Burwell for $1,100 is being sold, along with some other household goods. It's very, it brings to life the, um, the concept that, or the ideas, the, the history itself of the, the time, you know, it, it uh, makes you realize who you were from <laughs> and what you could or could not do and, and where you were in, in the place of America itself. You were considered property and you had no rights, no freedoms, no anything. And to be owned by Jefferson, to live up on the mountain and upon his death, you were sold as all the other slaves throughout Virginia. It's very ironic. Today, I came from three sets of Jefferson slaves. One family line was Great George and Queen Ursula. Uh, Queen Ursula was a pastry cook, and she had been with Jefferson back in the 1770 time frame. Most of my ancestors date back to the 1700s with, with Jefferson, 1770s, Ford. Uh, some were inherited through his, uh, from his mother and some from his wife's dower. 
but for the younger generations, all they knew was Monticello, and this was home to them, unless they were on one of his other plantations or with his daughters and, and their families. But for the most part, this is all that they knew, as well as many other people. What became familiar to them was home to them, and people there became family to them as much as they could allow themselves to feel a, co a connection with. And I do believe that my ancestors at Monticello had a family group. They, they were very close-knit. I can't say that they felt totally as Virginians or Americans either because I don't think that we ever really connected. We never had a total sense of belonging or acceptance because we were never accepted as people. We were accepted as property, as a means of, of making the owner an income or or for his own needs and survival. I think Wormley's identity was the gardener, the, the nailer, the, you know. I, I can't think that we identified ourselves totally as any one thing for, for fear that it, whatever we related to or became accustomed to would be stripped away from us. I do believe that there was a great sense of loyalty and I do believe that they care for Jefferson. I never deny that. And I think, for the most part, Jefferson cared deeply for my, for my ancestors as much as he was able to care for anything or anyone. And I think he was fascinated. The thoughts of slavery and trying to understand the roles that our ancestors played is a very difficult task because unless you were a person privy to the court system or, or to the working of the court system or to have a master that would allow you to do this or unless he was um, hiring you out and you were treated bad and he filed a, a suit to <laughs> recover what he was due, there's no, no documentation regarding you. All you can do is just generalize and you're sort of feeling like in limbo because you don't know what type of ancestor you had? Would I have had an ancestor that would have been a runner? Would he have been a rebellious person? Would he have gone out and um, created everything to have the patrollers patrolling every night? Or would he have been quiet? Would he have um, ground glass or mercury to poison people? Or would he have been one that burned the jails or the courthouses down? What would he have done? Did he work in the fields or in the houses? What would I do at that time? Those are the questions that plague me regularly. Um, my ancestors being Jefferson slaves, this is only one part of who I am. I have books on about seven other lines that make me who I am. And I'm really plagued over who these people were and, and what did they do. And there's very, very little documentation. All I can do is read and try to understand the whole concept of slavery and to look at, back at pictures to realize the type of quarters that they had to maintain or to look at the county of courts. One of the best things that I have come in contact with is a 1936 book published by June Guild, which uh, is acts to the, to the uh, assembly, which is the Black Laws of Virginia. These were laws that were written that govern what blacks could do, whether you were free, indentured, or slaves. And to me, it's like a mini Bible, because you really need to know what your ancestors could or could not do in order to research them. Once you realize that marriages were not actually legal, there was no uh, written account of a marriage, then you know when you go to the court, there's no need looking for a marriage until after 1867. But in the county rec, um, but in family accounts and family bibles of these owners, many times they're listed there. Many of the slave quarters housed numerous people in a eight by ten, ten by twenty space, wooden um, chimneys, which often caught on fire, and they'd have to push them over. Some were stone chimneys. Some, <laughs> I imagine, didn't have much of anything. Uh, they were earth floors. Some were uh, stone, some were wood, just whatever was available at the time, 
few blankets, clothing. For the most part that I found in Virginia and Fauquier County, in the county in which I live, the accounts there were where blacks were hired out on an annual basis. They were given um, a warm blanket, a suit of woolen clothes, shoes, and they were supposed to be treated humanely. And if by chance they were not, the person hiring them out would file suit against the person that they hired them to for a plea of debt to do for um, unjust uh, detainer. Well, if I put myself in that position, I think I probably could have maybe done a little more damage, <laughs> you know. Um, Everything is on an individual basis and, and what was going on at the time. Anytime I found that, anytime there was a question of any type of rebellion, the patrollers patrolled that much more. They were constantly out on the um, plantations and they would go in and check to see where everybody was. Well, really, if he's the only person that killed 50 people, it's a miracle. Because anyone that would allow themselves to think as to the injustices of slavery would do far worse than that. For our slaves, most of us, we, I would say, we didn't uh, dwell on the injustices because it was no way to be rational about any of it because you were treated irrationally. You, you, have to, you have to question the rationale behind everything. As a mother, you would think, why would a person go out and kill the children? They were innocent, they had nothing to do about it. But at the same time, you would think, a father killing children of the owner that means those children of that owner would be the owner of his children. So it's like, if I wipe off the next generation, then maybe it'll stop there. So you really can't totally understand everything. You can only draw different conclusions. You can think, but everything is on an individual basis as to what you think, because you weren't there, and it wasn't you. But I, I truly think that once you started killing one person, the next person, you were not in control and you, you didn't know what you were doing at that point because you were brought up in a society in a time that was not humane. Slavery is nothing about slavery that was humane or any acts of kindness throughout, regardless of how kind, quote unquote, your slave owner was. You were still property. At that point, Philadelphia was a hoax. Philadelphia was a means of freedom, a means of jobs, maybe of reconnecting with a family member that had escaped the um, trials of slavery here in Virginia. Philadelphia, after the war, held jobs. Preachers from Fauquier County, Virginia, also were preachers in uh, Philadelphia, which was amazing to me, Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania. All of that, um, it just lets me know how easily they moved around. When I think about the conditions of, of the roads or the means of travel, I tend to think that they always were right in that same community. But when you actually go and find the documents, they went everywhere. They, they were very, very smart people to um, come into an area where you knew nothing of the language, nothing of the culture, but to be able to be enslaved and then to reason and to understand a way to survive and to still have descendants living today, to me, that is a remarkable group of people. Oh, I want children to understand that history happened and never take life for granted. Take everything that it offers you and then strive for more because nothing is easy in this world. Take nothing, nothing at all for granted, but be proud of who you are because your people were rich in so many ways and they built this America in which we live. And one day, one day somewhere, <laughs> things hopefully will be equal, but not, not here, 
but we have to educate our children, and our children need to know that education is the key. Education has to be high on your list of priorities, and your family units, your groups, your churches, everything. We are a family, and we need to remain as a family and as a group of people, and to connect somewhere, to feel a connection.